Welcome to Storymaker, super short video, Vine, Instagram, and more. I'm Becky Wiegand, the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. I've been with the organization for about six years, and prior to that spent 10 years working for small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. Also joining us today, our guests are Aaron Bramley, who is a communicator and collabor collaborator with expertise in video, social media, public relations, marketing communications, and a whole host of other things. For the last eight years, Aaron has worked as the Director of Digital Media, and he is also the co-founder and interim executive director of Lights Camera Help. Additionally, we have Melissa Thompson who is the senior video director or video producer at Greenpeace USA, and where she has found her way into filmmaking through activism. And she has created short documentaries including In the Weeds, Waiting for a Living about a restaurant, uh, about restaurant work like A Ship in the Night about reproductive rights, and The Road of Women about political prisoners. She has uh, worked on her latest productions, which are these six second or less videos, and she helps co-direct those with her two-year-old daughter. So you can find her work on Greenpeace's social channels and video channels. So you'll uh, hear more from her about her experience using Greenpeace's channels to create uh, and share video, particularly around super short video, later on. An introduction to today's agenda, we'll be talking a little bit about who is TechSoup and our Storymakers 2014 campaign that has just launched. And we'll have some time to hear from you about what your expertise is on, on using video and creating video at your organization. And then we'll hear from Erin about Teeny Tiny Video, Great Big Impact. And then we'll hear from Melissa to talk about how Greenpeace uses those super short videos. And we'll see lots of examples throughout the webinar. So TechSoup is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are working toward the day when every nonprofit, NGO, and library on the planet has the technology, resources, and knowledge they need to operate at their full potential. We've done this since 1987, serving more than 200,000 charitable organizations in more than 60 countries around the world. And we do this in a variety of ways, uh, including our donation program with donor partners like Microsoft and Adobe, but also in programs like this webinar and events like our Storymakers 2014. So we work to create education and community around technology and how organizations can leverage the use of technologies like digital storytelling to help meet their missions. And Storymakers 2014, what you see on your screen right now is um, the five photo spread winning uh, submission from, from Flickr from one of our participants from a past Storymakers event. And we tell stories because they help connect us to our community of supporters, and they help connect us and connect one another to our causes for change. And so we would invite you to come to Storymakers 2014, which Submissions just opened uh, yesterday at TechSoup.org slash Storymakers where you can learn about the different events that we're holding. This webinar is the second in the series of webinars, and there are more coming up. Uh, so watch for more on that later. But in addition to the events, the big thing that we do is we challenge you, the nonprofit and library and uh, foundation listeners who are joining us today, to Put yourself out there in a digital format. Put your story out there. Put the story of the heroes in your community out there, um, whether it's in a six-second short video or a five-second uh, photo spread or a two-minute YouTube video, that we want to hear your story. And in doing that, you become eligible for these great cash prizes this year. So I'm just putting that up on the screen as a little bit of inspiration before we get started with the um, – with the polls of today. So I'd like you to go ahead and let us know uh, where you're at with storytelling, and particularly with short form video since that's the topic at hand today. Have you created super short form video before? Maybe you've done it personally for fun or for your family, or you like shooting short videos of your dog or your kids. Or maybe you've done it for your organization. Or maybe you are new to the whole topic. So we'd love to know where you are at because that will help inform our presenters today so they can speak best to your needs hopefully in their next section. So I'm going to give just a moment for people to respond. 
We have just about 300 people joining us today. So we've got a great big crowd, and we'll do our best to serve you well in this hour. Manny comments that they've done a short one for mission trips. That's great. Jacarelli asks if we speak Spanish in Si hablo español. <laughs> so we know you can't see the chat question, so if there are comments shared in the chat that we think are useful or interesting for others, we'll try and share those back out with you as well. So looking at the results of this one, about 65.5% of our participants don't or have never created super short form video, and around 20 3% have done it personally, but only 11.5% 11, 11 have done it for their organization. So that is really helpful to know. So we have a lot of people who are new to this format. So I think this is a perfect environment for you to learn and hopefully be inspired by the stories you see shared today. Next, uh, what platforms do you use to share video with your audience? And obviously if you're not creating video, this question may not be all that useful to you. Um, but if you are creating video, what are the platforms you most often use? And feel free to check off more than one of these platforms if it makes sense for your answer. Christina comments that she's shared on Instagram the Ice Bucket Challenge, on Facebook. So that's great. I know a lot of people doing the Ice Bucket Challenge these days including some tech supers most recently. So go ahead and click that screen. We're still collecting responses. A lot of people are participating. And since this one has multiple choice and multiple answers, I want to give just a moment for people to respond. Tasha says that she's created videos on Flippergram, which I didn't include here because I was limited to 10 choices. But I've created some Flippergrams too, and it's a fun, fun little app I carry in my pocket. <coughs> Dana comments that Google Plus is her other that she has created videos on. And Mary comments Animoto is one that they've used, which is great. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results of this one for everyone to see too. So YouTube is by far the biggest uh, platform that people share their content on, their video content, followed by Facebook and self-hosted on their own website. That's great. And let's go ahead and do another quick question before I bring our expert presenters on today. So, and this is really a question. We, may, we know that you may not know this, and these are some big round numbers, and so your budget may fall someplace in between these. But as a roundabout guess, how much of your organization's annual budget is dedicated to creating video? And again, this is a, a way of us gauging sort of your capacity to invest in these technologies, to get on board with them. We know that creating video can vary and range from being created with the cell phone in your pocket and you filming for a few seconds and immediately sending it up to Facebook to uh, huge budgets, uh, sometimes even multi-million dollar budgets for video production with production studios involved and directors and sound editors and all kinds of fancy stuff. So we would love to know kind of where you're at on this spectrum. And it seems pretty clear that the great majority of organizations are in that zero category or $1,000 or less which I would have guessed probably if I was taking a stab in the dark. So around half of our audience has zero budget, and another 24% has $1,000 or less. That's really helpful to know, and that's especially why platforms like Vine or Instagram or Flippagram or Mixbit are real possibilities to create these super short videos for you because we do carry them in our pockets, on our phones, on our apps. So who produces the videos at your organization for those of you uh, who do? And for those of you who don't, go ahead and click No One. <laughs> uh, and this is to help just understand sort of where your video work is focused. Is it mostly people on your communications and marketing team if you have those teams? Uh, is it 
concentrated on a social media team, or do you actually have a video team, or do you have to hire contractors or find external maybe volunteers who are doing it pro bono for you? And this is just helpful for us to have an idea of, again, the spectrum of, of where you are at in your organization. So I'm going to give just a few more seconds to hand this over. I'll go ahead and show the results. And it looks like 35% have no one who is dedicated to this, or not even dedicated to it, but nobody who is producing video. And 28% use volunteers, and that would fit, especially considering that most of you have no budget or a very small budget for video production. Great. Well, this is really helpful. So thank you for taking part in those polls. I'm going to go ahead and invite our first presenter to the, to the program today, Erin Bramley, who is the founder of Lights Camera Help, to talk to us about Teeny Tiny Video, Great Big Impact, and to share some in inspiring examples of how nonprofits can leverage these platforms for change. Welcome to the program, Erin. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Becky. And thank all of you out there in Internet land for having me as well. Uh, at least my voice through your phone or computer uh, as much as that is. So uh, as Becky said, I'm uh, the founder of Lights Camera Help. It's a cause-driven organization dedicated to encouraging other nonprofits to use film and video in order to get their message out. Uh, that's a passion project for me. Uh, my day job is as the Director of Digital Media for a public relations agency uh, in communication. So I uh, am producing a lot of content, developing social media strategy. Uh, largely I do digital media strategy as part of my uh, day job um, almost pretty much full time. So I'm in this world all the time working on it. I, I've been fascinated with uh, the prospect of using super short uh, videos to, to get out there. Uh, and I'm really sort of curious to see how other folks are using them, as I'm sure all of you guys are as well. And we're going to share some of that today. Uh, but first we'll go ahead and cover what these apps are. So these are smartphone apps, right? Um, the sort of category of super short video sort of falls in these little uh, smartphone apps. Vine was the first one and most popular, and then Instagram followed. Mixbit is one that uh, I'm going to talk about simply because uh, it's from the creators of YouTube. Um, now, not a lot of people are using Mixbit right now. It has some really great features in it, um, but uh, you know the the folks who created YouTube struck video gold early on. Uh, in the sort of social media and online uh, messaging world. And so we're going to make sure that they're not out of the game just quite yet, even though they're not a real big player. Um, Vine is 16 months old, right? Uh, maybe a little bit more at this point, but not a whole lot than that, uh, a lot, whole lot older than that, um, which makes it super new still, right? It's untested as a communications method for nonprofits, right? Uh, there's a lot of campaigns and things like that that are starting to come out, but the, the jury's still out on whether this stuff is going to be extremely effective. It is, however, exciting and fun, and you can do a lot of really interesting stuff with it. So uh, it's been purchased by Twitter, so they now own that as a, a web property of their own. Videos can be six seconds maximum, and the reason they did that uh, was purely because they wanted it to be super fast. They wanted videos to play almost instantly when you're scrolling through them on your phone. Um, so there was a size requirement with their, their open API that they had. And an API is something that allows this uh, app to talk with other apps. right? But they wanted to make sure that uh, everything stayed super small, so they decided on six seconds. Uh, originally it was seven seconds, but they were getting the app to crash a whole bunch, so they narrowed it down one second, and that helped. Pretty easy to use. You download the app, create your account. Um, you touch the screen to record. You lift your finger to stop recording. Um, so you can tap it and record just for a microsecond, or you can hold it down and record for all six seconds. Um, so it's great for stop motion animation, which you see a lot, and uh, also people are creating really interesting collections of work. So for campaigns, for instance, you can create a stream of content about that, um, which is the, one of the ways that nonprofits are using it right now. Uh, Instagram um, started as a photo sharing app. It allows you to uh, record up to 15 seconds of video now, the same way where you tap your finger on the screen in order to make it record, lift your finger to stop. Um, 
it has some benefits in that the videos are editable, which uh, originally Vine did not allow. They are starting to allow that now with their latest release. So they've sort of caught up with that. Uh, Instagram video is also really new uh, since last June, right? Not this past June, but the June before that. Um, so a little bit more than a year they've been uh, using video online. Now, they're owned by Facebook. It seems like when someone has a good idea, one of these big dogs comes and snatches it up, right? Um, so Facebook now owns them. They have over 150 million active users, which is a tremendous audience, um, with 1.2 billion interactions. Um, those are those likes, right, per day. So people are on there hitting that little heart button all the time on Instagram. Um, and you can create pri private accounts, which is useful for some folks, for nonprofits, you probably want everything to remain public as possible because that's the idea. You want everything to be seen as much as you can. Uh, one of the really interesting things about Instagram is that that is where a lot of young people are these days. I was actually sitting on a plane the other day next to a girl who was probably 17 and her kid brother who was 12 or 13, right? And she was looking at her Facebook and she pointed it over to her brother, you know, and she's like, oh, look at this post. And her brother looks at her and goes, Pfft. Who uses Facebook anymore? Um, so it seems to me, and that's just you know one small example, but Instagram is really where a lot of younger folks are starting to share um, amongst each other and create little communities. Uh, next, Mixbit uh, publicly launched uh, a year ago, um, almost to the day. Like I said, from the creators of YouTube, they allow you to create up to an hour of content in one single video, right? So it's not super short that way. However, it uses, the, so the, the little joke that they have is mixed bit, right? It uses bits, so they have chunks of 16, which is a technological little measurement, right? 16-bit, um, right, as opposed to 8-bit or 32-bit or whatever. Anyways, um, I, you guys might be nerds, you might not, but I totally am, so I sort of get that, but it allows you to chunk together these little 16-second sections to create a video. Um, however, there's no virtually, any virtually cause content on there at all. Uh, when I was on there searching around, the only cause that I found was like someone moaning about how she should be able to get more sleep. And like that was her big cause. So yes, I agree. We all need more sleep. Not really uh, super impactful. But it has a ton of functionality in it. So it allows you to save drafts, which a lot of other people really wish that other systems would allow you to do. You can edit things. You can publish them later. You can share them and collaborate with other folks. Um, so yeah, don't necessarily need to jump out and get a mixed bit account or anything like that. Just so you know, that is something that is on there. So. How are nonprofits using super short videos right now? Well, these are three main categories that I see. I'd love to hear if you guys think there are any other categories in here. So please type that in the chat box. I'd love to hear about that. But we got thank you videos, fundraising videos, and mission execution videos. The first two are pretty explanatory, self-explanatory. The last one, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but video can actually help you accomplish your mission a lot of times. If you're an organization that tries to get you to change um, hearts and minds, right, or get people to quit smoking, for instance, right, you can actually have a Vine video that goes out there and really helps you accomplish your mission if you're a public, a public awareness. So uh, here's a little example of a thank you video from uh, an organization called Diabetes UK. You can see it's super short and easy to use. I'm going to go ahead and hit the play button and let you guys watch it. <laughs> Right, so quick 15 seconds um, there just to sort of get um, this content out there, right, thanking folks. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other examples within this presentation. So you see on here, right, you, go, uh, you guys have that uh, in your email, and I believe they're going to send it out afterwards. But go ahead and click through the rest of those examples. Um, like I said, that was one just small example. A lot of times I've actually seen things where people are holding up signs that thank someone using their Twitter hashtag, right? And what better way to get someone to retweet your message than to actually use their hashtag, send it out to them as a personalized thank you video to the, the person who donated your 10th, your 20th, your 30th donation, right? Kind of interesting and, and neat stuff. 
Uh, this next one uh, is a fundraising video, and a good example of this, this was actually done for a competition from the Chronicle of Philanthropy. They did a competition called the Six Second Appeal, and um, I was lucky enough to be able to judge that, and there were lots of great examples of it. Uh, the Testicular Cancer Found Society, I think, did a really phenomenal job with creating a video. It's a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, so go ahead and see whether you can uh, observe some of the comedy that they have going on while getting across a really nice message. Our awareness cards cost three cents, which means your cents can provide a lot of support. Please donate today. Right, so their cards cost six cent, or three cents. Um, they uh, have them on there. Check out the logo, right, uh, for a testicular cancer research center. Our awareness cards cost three cents, which means your uh, cents can provide a lot of support. Please yeah. donate. So today. lots of balls all over the place. Um, you know, and, and they like to have fun with their mission. It's a very serious thing, right? Um, but you have to be able to, to laugh at something. So they're trying to raise money. Super easy stuff. But they, they wanted to make sure that people got the message out. Um, yeah, I was actually talking with one of these folks, and they were talking about one initiative, and I was like, oh, that's crazy that you did that. And he goes, no, I'm not crazy. I'm just half nuts. Uh, which was kind of a nice little testicular cancer joke that you guys can use with people who are ready to laugh. Anyways, um, as far as mission execution, right, this works a lot with awareness videos. So uh, we have Ash here, and this is a video about uh, folks who, uh, they, you know, they want to quit smoking, so that makes them sort of quit you know, try to quit smoking with a message. Um, this is a great message about adoption. Uh, and this is uh, a friend like Tuna as a cute little dog, right? Um, and if you have video and you, if you're an organization that works with um, animals, making video really super easy to get traction. Um, however, this, this one uh, I think is a really interesting video uh, that does a great job of building off of the loop that these things naturally have in them. So Vine videos loop on sort of a continuous basis, right, until you scroll past them or stop them by pushing your finger. So check this one out. Right, so imagine it's looping. Right, and so when you watch this on Vine, it just c continually, this guy is just sort of breathing in and out, right, with the sign that says, this breath made possible, just sort of really sort of showing what it is that they're after. So, yeah, um, I've got five minutes left of my content, and I know I'm like buzzing along like I've had way too much coffee to drink today, which may actually be the case, but I want to go ahead and show you uh, some examples of what works best in production, right? So stop motion is really great. You guys have maybe seen these. Anytime you've seen a claymation movie or old cartoons, right, that stop motion animation, um, that's really good stop motion animation. Uh, it's a little bit trickier to do that in uh, some of this context. Before and after is sort of like this magical cut kind of thing that happens, and I'm going to show you an example of that. And then finally, straight up linear storytelling. We're going to talk about some of the, the benefits and drawbacks of that. For stop motion animation, this is a video that I made uh, to um, promote this particular presentation one time when I was doing hey, it. Funny. Great, big, impact, right? And so uh, I made that. It probably took me about an hour and a half to do all of that um, with my, my Vine app open, holding my phone, tracing out a little thing, hitting the button, tracing out a little thing, hitting the button, right? Hour and a half, another little bit of time to actually plan that out. Uh, when you think about stop motion animation, you have to think that you're going to be thinking about 12 frames per second. So that's actually 12 little snapshots per second that you're, you're doing stuff if you want relatively smooth animation. Um, you know, if you're going to do really smooth, like some of the, pr the pros, they'll actually get to 25 or 30 frames per second, 30 images, snapshots per second. Um, so do that math a little bit when you're thinking about embarking on a stop motion animation project. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But this is an example of the before and after stuff. And this guy is really just the king of it. This is a long video. I'm not going to show all of it, just a, a minute or so. Um, but I will go ahead and uh, make this guy sort of explain it himself here. Getting ready in the morning. Oh, this is just a picture, and this is a video on a computer screen. Channel here? Yeah. Okay.
Okay, that's me. Holy what crap, the that's hell, amazing. Man? When you have too much birthday cake. Oh. This is how okay, that's a good one to leave it on, right? Real classy here. Um, so the idea is that this guy actually probably did a little bit of his editing in um, in Final Cut, but uh, what what they're doing is they're leading you up to a certain point and then making this cut where something changes. And I saw someone do a really great version of this uh, actually right in front of me for a presentation that I was doing where the organization that, that helps drill wells. And so they took some change, they put it in a cup, they swirled that cup around, and then all of a sudden, boom, the change turned into water. Right? And so that's the kind of before and after kind of thing that they're doing. Uh, and then the super short story portion of things, right? if you want to actually just tell a linear story within this, you have to think long and hard about what you're actually going to say. If you're not going to rely on fancy schmancy stop motion an animation or uh, the before and after kind of magic stuff, you have to think about really condensing your message way down. And so consider this story, it's attributed to Ernest Hemingway. Someone challenged him to write a super short story in six words or, or less. And so he said, for sale, baby clothes, never worn. And to me, that's really haunting, actually, because of everything that it evokes, right? You know that there's a story there. Other great examples of this are the Race Card Project by Michelle Norris. She's an NPR um, producer and, and journalist. Um, and and they, she asked people to write six-word stories about what race means to them. And so when you consider that context, someone who has this story, please stop saying, I am articulate, is a good way to kind of um, tell a, a, a story in six words or less. Um, let's see here. This Green Priest video, I believe Melissa is going to show you later on, so we're not going to uh, touch on that now. And we're going to buzz real quick through a few great tricks, tips and tricks in production. I know that I'm getting near the end of my time here, but I want to leave you with some, some great actionable items, right? And all this information is going to be available for you afterwards. But in stop motion, it's really important, as I said, plan your shoot. Make sure you know how many shots it's going to do. Do as many tests as you need in order to be comfortable. Lock down your phone. It's important to make a tripod or use a tripod or make a makeshift tripod. I've seen people put things together with a piece of cardboard and binder clips and just Google binder clip iPhone tripod and you'll be able to find an example of that. Um, if you want, you can just take stills in Instagram and upload those or, or upload stills into Instagram and turn that into a video if you want. Consistent lighting is really key. This stuff takes a long time. The sun will move overhead and can wind up changing things significantly for you in the way the, the shot's done. So uh, in using the before and after, like that Zach King stuff, it's all in the cut, so focus all of your energy on that. Uh, a tripod is really helpful in order to get the, that continuity of, of a shot there so the camera doesn't move around at all. Uh, in that respect, it is similar to stop motion animation. So you've got to have some other folks there to really help you out and make sure that you guys are, are getting really great footage. And sound is great to distract with. So it's the old ma magician's thing, right, where you distract over here to the left. Meanwhile, over the right, you're fiddling with something or making something else happen, right? With all of these, it all takes a lot of practice just to make sure that you're doing it right. So don't be afraid to fail. Just get out there, start recording stuff, and see what's up. If you're going to be doing the super short story, think first, what is the goal? out of what it is that I'm doing. Um, and then after that, you can figure out what plot it is that accomplishes your goal. So a goal can be is like, we want to raise money, we want to recruit volunteers, we want people to um, you know, come and help donate to our uh, cause, whatever that is, uh, build robotics for paraplegic puppies, or, or whatever that, that thing is that you want people to do. Right? Think about what that is, and then define the plot that gets you there. And then once you have the plot, you can create your character that moves that plot along, and then the, the accompanying message is really important. So that tweet that goes with it. On Instagram, they have the little thing on the side that is your explanation of what's going on, right? That provides all the context for your entire clip. So make sure that that is really well crafted. Interesting communications exercise to tell a full story in 140 characters or less, although it's probably more like 120 characters because you've got to leave room for your link. Don't forget that. Uh, and then keep it simple, stupid, right? If you're going to be doing this uh, super short story, don't try to tell Star Wars in six seconds, um, although that would be kind of fascinating to watch. Uh, then there's some really great stuff on how people see this content. Uh, these are three good examples of that sort of stuff. We're going to go through them all in, uh, don't worry, uh, Becky, we're going to get through them all in 20 seconds each. Okay, you ready? 
So uh, YouTube compilations, basically people take all these Vine videos and they put them into one big compilation and then you watch you know, five minutes of it like that Zach King thing. Um, so it works great to collect videos around a hashtag and put that out there. You can have your community creating videos through these systems, pull them down, put them into a YouTube compilation and make that happen, right? Pretty great. Um, and then it allows you to embed things as well and you can curate all this content. However, with hashtags, um, that's a great way to keep track of the conversation uh, of your, your video, but keep in mind, nobody owns a hashtag. So for uh, a presentation that I did, I did hashtag teeny tiny, um, and it should have been South by teeny tiny rather than just teeny tiny because during my presentation we were looking at all these videos and there were like a few, you know, girls who were talking about how awesomely small their waists were, which in a South by Southwest interactive audience did not go over super well. Um, so just keep that in mind right? Um, when creating content is you want to make sure that you put things as sort of differentiated from the general conversation as possible. Um, it also helps to build a network of followers on all these different platforms, and that works like any other social media platform. And I do whole presentations on this as well, but a few great little tips for you are right here. Social media is quid pro quo, meaning it's tit for tat. If you follow someone else, they're going to be that much more likely to follow you back. Try to be a human being, so eliminate the logo from your avatar, right? Make sure that people understand there's a person behind that. It's okay to ask people to retweet resend out your, comp, your content, um, ask them to just go ahead and send that out for you. And then if you really want people to follow you on a consistent basis, you need to make sure that you're consistently putting out good quality content. So if you really want to invest in this, one video a week every week, right? One video a day every day if you can do that. But make sure that you're consistent so people know every Tuesday I can come to this organization and find the latest Vine video um, from them, right? Uh, and then cross-promote throughout all your channels. Syndication is key. Uh, and then experimentation is rewarded. So please, please, please just put it out there, right? See what happens. The worst that could happen is people, s well, there's trolls out there who will, might compare you to famous anti-Semites. But uh, other than that, like, there's not a whole lot bad that can happen. Um, so if you have slightly thick skin, you can get away with it, right? So please just go ahead and start picking it up. Point your camera at something. Take some videos. Share them with us. I'd love to see what you guys create. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to um, <clears throat> the fine folks at TechSoup and, and uh, our next great speaker here, Melissa Thompson. Thank you so much for having me today, and I'd be happy to answer questions later on. Thank you so much for that, Aaron. And for all of those amazing links that are in his presentation, don't worry, you'll get that later on today. And for those of, the, those of you who were registered earlier today, or before earlier today, you would have that presentation already attached uh, as a link on the right side of that email that you can look at those links and continue feeling inspired by all of the videos that he shared. I'd like to go ahead and welcome our next presenter, Melissa Thompson, who is a senior video producer at Greenpeace. And she's going to walk us through, as a case study of sorts, how Greenpeace has been using super short form video to really change the conversation and to create new conversations um, around their advocacy and action campaigns. So welcome to the program, Melissa. We're glad to have you join us. Thanks so much. I really am flattered and thrilled to be here. Um, I'm one of two producers here in the U.S. We publish on average a video a week, and that can range from six seconds to a feature-length documentary and everything in between. Um, we do about 90% of all of the production and editing in-house, and the other 10% is working with production companies, agencies, stuff like that. Um, in case anyone wants some background reading, here's a really fantastic oops, sorry, article about our corporate campaigns and how we work. Um, so things are really shifting, I feel like, as a video producer in my job. And for so long, people have been so focused on YouTube and that sort of like perfect short but um, not too short video, one to three minutes. Um, and now things are really changing. And we're finding that, yes, the super short videos are great, but also, um, People are watching longer pieces if they feel really engaged, and people are also tuning into transmedia projects that are very interactive um, web projects where video is incorporated. And I've got a couple examples there. 
Um, and this just says the same thing, so I'm going to fly past that. We're also doing more and more with SMS, with texting. Um, we've found that it's a great way to collect information that we can use to contact people and uh, around future campaigns. So for example, we're, we're playing around a lot with putting um, asking people to text when they've seen a video, and that way we can save their information for later. Um, we did this recently. We did a really great series of videos with comedian Reggie Watts, and the day before the videos went live, um, we put out a Vine and, and tweeted saying, you know, text this, te text laugh to this number, and you'll get the videos in advance. Um, so we had lots of people texting in, and we were able to, to sit, collect that information um, and use it for, for future campaigns. Um, we're still uploading to YouTube, of course, and always sharing with Google+. But we're also finding that we're not as obsessed with the YouTube view number as we used to be. And it's more important that we're uploading videos to m various different platforms and not worrying so much about like whether we got you know, 10,000 on YouTube. Um, because Facebook uploads are we found are neck and neck with um, the YouTube views. So we're getting tons of people um, watching the videos. They look really nice when you do Facebook um, uploads. So we're doing that with all our videos now. We're doing direct Facebook uploads. Um, and also we're making multiple different versions of videos. So um, I'll show you an example. We, Mitch was out, my co-producer was out in Montana at Glacier National Park shooting a, trying to shoot a time lapse a couple of weeks ago for a campaign video about coal exports. And uh, this animal wandered into the shot. And the video that we posted on YouTube of that um, animal got over 2 million hits on YouTube. So we also made a Vine, and we also made an Instagram video, and we also made an animated GIF. We basically, if something's working, take it into every format that you can. Um, and now just for fun, I will show you the little marmot guy. Yeah. So it's amazing what people really want to look at. But 2 million hits. <laughs> um, moving on, um, another thing that we've been really trying to learn from recently is that you know, we want people to share content. And if people feel like it's something that will make them look good, they're going to share it. So um, we had the opportunity to work with um, Aliyah Shawkat on a video a couple years ago. It was a, on a fairly dry topic. Again, it was about coal exports out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, but because it was done in a really fun way, um, and it was with her, and it was timed for the um, relaunch of Arrested Development on Netflix, it did really, really well. And even though it's a lot of scientific information and kind of campaign messaging, um, because people thought it was cool, um, it performed really, really well. And as a result, lots of people now have more information about, about the issue. Um, just a couple of slides about distribution and really thinking through before you make anything, who's your audience and who needs to see this video to achieve your goal. Again, I think a lot of times people get hung up on, we want to have a viral video or whatever that means, or we want to have a million hits. And sometimes that's actually not the most important thing. Um, a couple of examples. This is the video that I saw when I, before I applied for the Greenpeace job. This is actually the video that kind of sucked me in. It was absolutely amazing. It's really powerful. I encourage people to watch it later. Um, but this video had an, a, a massive impact. Um, a week after it launched, Unilever, the world's largest single buyer of palm oil, reversed its policy and said it would only buy palm oil from suppliers who could demonstrate they didn't cut down forests. Now. I think it's also important to think of videos as part, that Greenpeace videos are always part of a campaign. So at the same time that the video went out, activists dressed as, as orangutans were doing actions outside of several, several Unilever headquarters, um, and the company had received tens of thousands of emails from customers. Um, so, but this is a great example of, of how a video can really make a difference. Um, Another very different example is our Costco campaign that we ran successfully a few years ago. They were selling um, quite a number of Red List fish. And we realized we didn't need everyone in the world to see this video. We needed 
their leadership to see the video, and they did, and we heard about it. Um, so it really didn't matter to us that the view counts on YouTube weren't super high. We got we spoke to who we needed to, to talk to, and and their policies were changed. So I think that's a really important question for people to think about at the beginning: is you know, is it one person? Is it a politician? Or is it you know the general public? And that can really help determine what kind of video you make. Um, we started using Vine um, just doing little shoots during other shoots. So we were shooting this campaign video with our, um, John Hosvar, who's the director of our Oceans campaign. And Mitch just said, oh, let me just try this Vine thing while I'm out here. And did this really cute little Vine um, that got noticed and it was included in a terrific article from the Gates Foundation about different nonprofits using Vine. And I will play that now. The oxygen from every second breath that we take comes from our ocean. So that's just really, really simple. You don't have to know anything about stop motion. It's a really simple message. And some of the most powerful lines I've seen do just that. They're, they're not fancy. Um, for our Green My Internet campaign, where our targets were um, the big tech companies, that often own some of these platforms, we wanted to do something fancier and really use their tools to do fun stuff pointed directly back at them. Um, so this, I'll start talking here about sort of our, our latest strategy, which is really working with super users who are already well known on the platforms and getting them to distribute work which reaches totally different audiences that we would never um, be able to reach. So for example, for the Green My Internet campaign, um, we ran a Vine challenge. We put out a Vine a week, uh, I mean a Vine a day for a week, and encouraged people to submit Vines. Um, and then we contacted tons and tons of super users and asked them to please submit Vines to the Vine challenge. We didn't pay a dime for it, a uh, little bit of staff time involved. But we got tons of entries. I think we got about 50 entries. And one of them did phenomenally well. I think it got um, over 2,000 likes and about 100 V-Vines, um, which is way more than we could ever do if we had published it on the, the Greenpeace Vine account. This, so these are super users who are publishing Vines directly through their own channels, and then we're retweeting and re-vining them. And they're, they're reaching um, you know, their, their followers, which is really exciting. Uh, let me play the vine that we created to get people to submit. And then we asked people to send in vines and include certain hashtags which we aggregated um, to keep track of all of the vines that were coming in. And here's one of the winning entries. Uh, we used the same strategy in a, a recent campaign. We were um, trying to urge Lego to break up with Shell. Lego has a partnership with Shell. Um, and we again researched what super users on Vine were using Legos in their work, which is a whole other world that I never knew existed. But there's tons of people on Vine that love Legos. So I contacted every single one of them that I could get a hold of um, and asked them if they would consider making work, putting it out again on their own channels um, for the campaign. And again, we, had, we, um, we didn't run this as a Vine challenge. We ended up just working with two of the super users that we felt had the best quality work and had the biggest following. Um, and they made some fantastic Vines. I'll play one of them, which again performed really, really well. This is made by Andrew Jive. And I just heard from him today that um, he published something, a behind the scenes story on a platform called Stellar. And I'm going to actually paste that into the text box because it's fascinating. He shows piece by piece how he put this together. Um, encourage folks to look at that later. Um, so 
Erin already covered a lot of this, and I know we're running out of time. So um, I would just uh, skip to the tips. Again, if you're doing stop motion, a tripod really helps. Um, I ended up buying uh, an adapter that cost about five bucks that goes from the tripod to the phone. That's super handy. Um, I put the link there. And um, think about whether you if the looping effect is something that you want. If it is and you really need that effect, then definitely go with Vine. If it's not, maybe you should go with Instagram um, where you have a little more links to play with. Um, obviously keep it simple. Consider taking some of your most popular videos and making shorter versions of them so that you can repurpose some of the content and drive people back to the other content. And then my last point again is cultivate relationships with super users in order to reach new audiences. And that's it. Thank you for that, Melissa. Boy, it's been a road show here really quickly in this hour. Um, I love the idea of for those of you who have no budget and have no expertise and feel uncomfortable doing this, of looking out there for those super users and seeing if they'd be willing to create a short vine on behalf of your cause or on behalf of your organization. So I think that's a great way to get around a little bit of having to create it yourself if you're afraid of taking that first step. And you know, I love the variety of, of webinars or I'm sorry, of <laughs> vine clips that have been showed in this webinar um, from some of the really simple looking ones like Aaron showed the video of the guy with just a piece of paper on his chest just taking a breath over and over again. That that's really simple production and that's something that anybody could create with the cell phone in their pocket. And I think that's a great example. And then to the range of much more advanced and, and complicated production value ones like the beautiful Lego uh, video. I love that and I wish I was a Lego genius like that. Um, but I love that there's that wide range of examples to draw inspiration from. And I would recommend when you get the slide deck in the post event email later on, click through all of those links uh, in the examples that we didn't get to see today because there's so much inspiration out there of the way that nonprofits and causes and libraries are using Vines to reach their communities. So I'm excited to share that with you. And I hope that you'll then in turn share them with us. And so quickly I want to bring onto the line Ali Bastiki and our interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup just to talk a little bit about how to submit a story if you want to go forth and do that. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, Becky, and thank you so much, Erin and Melissa. You guys are awesome. This rocked. Um, it was really excellent. Um, if you all were inspired, inspired from this presentation, um, we'd just like to encourage you to get out there and think about creating a short Vine or Instagram video that you can submit to our Storymakers 2014 campaign or even one that you've created already. Um, from August 26, yesterday our campaign opened through September 26 you can visit TechSoup.org slash StoryMakers to submit your two-minute YouTube video, like I said, um, a short Vine or Instagram video, or a five-photo Flickr slideshow for um, some really great cash prizes this year. Um, we'll have two grand prize winners of $5,000 in Best Overall and Best STEM youth videos, as well as um, $1,000 cash prizes for um, super short and newbie videos. And then um, we're really excited to bring back uh, the period for community voting starting October 1st where we hope um, the community powers their own networks to vote for the Audience Choice Award. So please do come back and visit our Storymakers page to vote on your favor favorites and to submit your amazing stories. Thank you. Back to you Becky. Thank you, Allie. And just a quick look at those upcoming events uh, before we get to Q&A. So stick with us if you've got questions you want answered. Um, so submissions have opened, and you can get to them at TechSoup.org slash StoryMakers. And you know, we also have a global tweet chat coming up, another webinar in the series, StoryMakers Get Your Story Noticed with uh, Kimberly Bryant from Black Girls Code. And I'm drawing a blank on the other presenter. YouTube, thank you, <laughs> of course, is going to be jo joining us for that webinar. And then we'll be doing a webinar that's specific for libraries and how to uh, tell stories from your library, from your community of patrons on the 17th. We'll also have a lot of in-person events taking place in our NetSquared local communities and um, chapters around the world. So definitely check out that and see if there are any in-person events coming up. 
I'm now looking to get to Q&A. We have a lot of questions already being answered in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and address some to our presenters. So Kisana asks, and maybe Erin, this is a good question for you. So we talked about Instagram, Vine, and a little bit about Mixbit today. Um, are there other apps that people are using or can use to create these super short form videos? I'll say yes. Uh, there are a bunch of, vit of apps that are out there. Um, I've dabbled with many of them. Um, you know, and it's great to be an early adopter on things that are going to uh, pick up. Although, if I were to say, hey, I want to do super short video for my organization, I have limited resources, I want to get the most bang for my buck, I would hop on Instagram um, and just start using that, right? Uh, it's got the largest audience out of any of these. Um, you know, there's there's tons of, of other little video apps that are out there. 8mm is one, there's uh, TwitVid and Vidster and, you know, like find some weird word that has to do with video and cut all the vowels out of it, and that is now an app uh, for creating a network around uh, video. But really, in all honesty at this point, like I would say put all your eggs in either the Vine or the Instagram baskets um, and, and really focused on, on getting the most out of those that you can. Great. And other people mentioned Flipagram, which is great for taking photos and putting them into a video format. Some people mentioned Animoto. Um, so just to add to the list of things that people can Google there. Um, let's see. Chris asks, do you have to have a touch screen device to use these tools? So if you are still on an older flip phone, for example, and not a smartphone, can you use these tools? And I'm not quite sure. Do you guys know? I believe that you, in order to use these mobile apps, you definitely have to have a smartphone. Um, you know, there are ways to uh, quote unquote hijack Instagram or Vine through your desktop computer. So there are people who are doing that where they're they're, and and I think there are hacks out there online that help you do that. Um, but you know, for this content, really. If you're going to use the apps, you should probably be using a smartphone um, because it's all integrated, right? You can upload it, you can shoot it, you can edit it right all there. That's going to make it super easy for you. Uh, if you're not using a smartphone, I would say you just use YouTube, right? Um, most everyone said who who was sharing content via video said that they had a YouTube account, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, I've seen some really great, actually, five-second content out there on. YouTube, there's one called Missing from my presentation that was out there that everyone should go on and check because it's, it's just hilarious and cute and short and it's five seconds. Um, would you have a recommendation for one that's particularly good for stop motion app animation or stop motion video? Uh, I mean, I, I still think that Vine or Instagram are probably the, the way to go right now. There are a bunch of apps out there that are um, you know, specifically for that. Unfortunately, I can't think of any of them off the top of my head right now because for all my stop motion animation needs, I'm either I'm either editing in Final Cut, um, or if I'm not doing things at the pro level, then I'm just using Vine or Instagram. Okay, and that actually brings up another question that a few people have asked about, and I'd love to get your take, Aaron and Melissa's. What do you use to edit these? Do you use, you know, you mentioned that Mixbit has some more um, functionality that the others don't. Can you edit within that? And if you can't, what do you use to edit both of your uh, vines and things like that? Yeah, uh, I when I'm shooting in Vine, um, I actually don't do any editing. Uh, and that's part of the challenge is planning everything out ahead of time uh, because previously they didn't allow editing um, within there and they, they just released a little portion of editing where you can take out little clips. Um, so if you have a six second video and you've touched the screen 15 times to, to make your video, you can rearrange those and pull them around and, and move them and stuff like that now. Um, for Instagram, if you want to put a video up on Instagram uh, that you've edited on your computer, you can totally do that. I use Final Cut, like I said, uh, Premiere as well. Those are, are professional level software. I've also edited in uh, iMovie. You know, the YouTube editor is, is a tool that is getting better and better all the time. So if you have a YouTube account, uh, just go to youtube.com editor, 
and you can go in there and start playing around with editing your content. You upload, you upload all your content to the editor, and you can cut things together directly in there, add titles, add music, um, do all that kind of stuff, and then instantly go ahead and publish it. It's really handy. Okay, Melissa, your take on that? What do you use to sure. edit? Sure, my workflow is pretty much the same, either Vine or Final Cut. But I did want to add, a, someone brought this up in the chat, that if you have a longer video and you're not a video editor, but you want to grab six seconds of it, um, QuickTime is a great way. If you go into the Edit menu and, and do the Trim function, you can you know, make a six second clip of your long, if you have the mm -hmm. master of your video, and then use Vine um, Uploader for Vine to, to get it up into Vine. Great. Um, so, you know, Mara, switching gears a little bit, and so Melissa, this is for you. Asks, how do you find super users? So, how do you go about finding those people that might be able to create videos for your cause or as part of a campaign? For the Lego work, um, I literally just went into Vine and did a search for Lego, and looked at all of the videos <laughs> that came up. <laughs> And anything, and so people, if people put, um, you know, hashtag Lego in there, it's going to pop up. Um, and you know, there was some stuff that was wasn't, you know, particularly relevant or good. But I wrote to almost, you know, like certainly people that had either a, a decent following, I'd say, of you know anyone that had over 50 or more followers, um, or there was a couple people that didn't have great a great following but had made beautiful work. Um, and I literally, like in, in Vine, you can message people directly. Um, some people also list their email in their Vine profile. So for the people that listed their email, I just emailed folks. And for the people that didn't list their email, I sent them a private message through Vine. And I think I contacted about 30 people and I had about 10 responses. Um, so pre it's, yeah, it was worth my while. It was a couple hours of work, um, but we, it, it paid off. That's great. And so for those of you who are, maybe you have a personal account already on Vine or Instagram and you're wanting to use it professionally, do you guys have recommendations of how to do that? Would you recommend setting up a separate account or how do you, how do, you do that? I'd say you know, probably you want to set up an account for your organization um, that is not your personal account necessarily. Um, and so yeah, I mean, you create an account with your organization's name and put in an avatar that is either of your face um, or of the face of one of your constituents or just one of the people you serve or, or hopefully a human face. I, I, if you serve animals, you can do an animal face too. Um, and then go out there and, and follow people who are interested in the same things that you are. Comment on their videos, like them, pat them on the back, share them. Revine them, retweet them, re-Instagram them, that kind of thing, um, and and comment, right? And say, hey, I love this video. And then eventually when you have content yourself that you've put up there, uh, you can say, hey, I love this video. Check out one that I made that's similar um, and get people interested, right? It's all about conversation starting when it comes to creating networks through social media. So the best thing that you can possibly do is give to others and then you will receive from them. That's great advice. And we all know that giving and receiving work hand in hand. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and just let you know about upcoming webinars in general that we're holding here at TechSoup and hope that you'll join us for some of those. Next thir yes, next Thursday we'll be doing a webinar on Giving Tuesday and end of year fundraising with the folks from 92Y who created Giving Tuesday, as well as Wendy Harmon from the American Red Cross. Then we'll be having that Storymakers Global Tweet Chat that if you're on Twitter, you are welcome to join. It will be 24 hours of tweeting around the world about how to tell great stories for, for causes and for good. Um, and then that Storymakers Get Your Story Notice webinar with YouTube and Black Girls Code. And then your library story on the, night, on the 17th of September. Then lastly, we will have a webinar on how to raise funds and get grants for small communities on the 18th. So again, I hope you'll join us at TechSoup.org slash Storymakers. 
Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you, Melissa, for sharing your expertise briefly today. We know we covered a lot in the course of this hour, so look for that follow-up email so you can review any parts that you want to revisit and get more inspiration from the links that we weren't able to watch live during the, the event. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And lastly, thank you to our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, who provides the use of this platform for our webinars each week. We use ReadyTalk 500, which is also available in TechSoup's catalog. You can visit that at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. And before you leave us today, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey to help us continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.